Welcome back to the next episode of the Music History Project. Today's topic is industry heroes, guitar amp innovators. And the installment is going to focus on two of the industry icons, Jim Marshall and Hartley Peavy. All right, we're down for another episode, and Mike told us just before we started recording that this is episode 21. This is exciting. Hey. Well, I am happy that uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, two legends in the music products industry whose names are uh, synonymous with their products, and um, it's fun to hear the stories behind these names, Marshall and Peavy. Yeah, and so we're going to hear both of their full interviews Um which I believe, if I remember correctly, Jim Marshall's is posted actually on the website. So if you wanted to see the video content that goes along with the audio you're going to hear today, you just have to jump on our website, which is, I'll say it this time, www.nam.org slash library. Very nice. Thanks. And just a little background on Jim before we start with his uh, 2002 NAM oral history interview. He was uh, born in Kensington, uh, England in July of 1923, and we lost him in uh, April of uh, 2012. And what was really neat is um, Jim was at nearly every NAM trade show um, since his company began, and he was always out front signing T-shirts and autographs. In fact, a a funny joke that uh, someone once told me was, what's really rare is if you can find a Marshall T-shirt where Jim didn't sign. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so uh, he was very active. He loved talking to people, and um, it was such a pleasure to have the opportunity to uh, document his story. So this, again, goes back to July of 2002 at the uh, the summer show, I believe. Yeah, so we're going to jump right into it and hear Jim talking about his background, where he grew up, a lot of his childhood, as well as starting his own drum shop and teaching rock and roll to the neighborhood kids. It was in uh, North Kensington, in London. That's where I was born. But I grew up in hospital. All my young life I was in hospital. Oh, yes, I never had an education at all. My education has been in the wide world, you know. And what was the reason for that? Tubercular bones, that's bones that do not set. I was in a plaster cast from my ankles up to under my armpits all those years and um, they used to cut me out every three months to allow for growth. Mm. And when I was 12 and a half, they decided that my bones were setting properly then. And they sent me away to convalescence, to a seaside resort. And uh, then I got back with my family after that when I was just under 13. And um, we were then in the east end of London, and uh, my father put me to school, but I was only there for a few weeks when he changed his job (coughs) and went to Southall in Middlesex. And uh, from then on, I said to my father, you know, he said, said, well, he said, I'll find you another school. I said, is it worthwhile? I do not understand what they're talking about because the other school put me in the top class and I had no previous education, you see, so I didn't understand a thing. And I said to him, is it worthwhile? Because I do not understand what they're talking about. He said, I'll have the school authorities on to me. I said, no. I said, can I start work? I was 13 and a half then. And uh, he said, oh, I don't know. After a couple of weeks, he said, all right, then, you can be the shop boy in the shop. Because he was the manager there, you see. And (laughs) um, I suppose it was uh, just just before I went to the shop, he said, okay, you can start working in the shop as long as you learn tap dancing. He thought that would be good for my legs. Is that right? Yeah. You know, so (laughs) 
uh, I went to the tap dancing school and um, on the parents' night, which they always have, the teacher said to me, you are the only boy in the class this year. I don't know what to do with you. So after a couple of weeks, she said, I know what to do with you. You'll do the Fred Astaire bit. You'll stand in the middle on the stage and sing a few numbers. And then uh, the, the girls will then be dancing behind you while you do it. And then you can, after the few numbers, you can go into your routine. Well, at the end of the evening, the grandfather of one of the girls called me over and said, you've got a very nice voice, son. I said, thank you very much, sir. Went to walk away, he said, come back. He said, I'm playing locally this weekend with my 16-piece orchestra. He said, you sound very good with the pianist, but you might be no good at all with a 16-piece orchestra. So I went along and I did sort of half a dozen numbers. And uh, at the end of the evening, looking towards the stage, I was on the left-hand side, getting my jacket on to walk home. And he was on the right-hand side, and all of a sudden I heard, Marshall. I looked over, and he always looked a bit fierce, this band leader. Uh, I walked over to him, he said, what are you scared of, son? I was not going to say you, <laughs> which I was. Uh, I said, oh, I just thought I might have made some mistakes. He said, no, you made no mistakes at all, son. You start with the orchestra regularly on Monday. So I was with a 16-piece orchestra. It was not always a 16-piece. It used to break up the band to do smaller gigs. And uh, as I said, I was singing five, six times a week and getting paid five shillings a night, which was very good in those days, way back in 1937. <laughs> so uh, that's how I started in music. So that band was sort of the, the big band? It was one of the big swing. bands, yes, yes. It was very good, actually. And it traveled quite a bit? Or did oh, yeah, well, it was mainly in the London area, fortunately mm -hmm. enough. So we used to get on the bandwagon and go, you know. And uh, then after a while, I left that band because I was invited to play with a, a jazz dance band. And uh, that was a seven-piece. <clears throat> and uh, I got friendly with uh, a couple of boxers. One was going to fight for the British title. And I used to run around South Hall Rec with him in the morning. And one day he said to me, what do you do? I said, well, I do a lot of things, actually. I said, at four o'clock in the morning, I help a milkman fill milk bottles. At um, eight o'clock, I go into a jam factory for 48 hours a week. And at night time, I sing five or six times a week. He said, where do you sing? I told him it was one of the clubs in Southall. And he said, I'm going to come along there so he'll listen to you. So he came along with another boxer. <coughs> <coughs> And then during the intervals, fights started to break out. The young yobs, you know, they, they were all trying to prove they were a Jackie Rankin and Sid Wogan. <laughs> so the pianist said to me, well, you've done tap dancing. Uh, you must have a good sense of rhythm. I said, well, not bad, you know. He said, well, what we'll do in future, you and I will stay on the stand and keep music going. That might stop the fighting. And it did. Was it the first time that you played? first time I played drums, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, then, later on, the band leader got called up. He was the drummer leader. And uh, the pianist called a meeting and said, look, if you continue on drums and singing, he said, we're not booked as a specific amount of people. He said, so we can share the money six ways instead of seven. I said, that suits me. <laughs> so... Uh, Basically, I was rich when I was 14, because I got seven and sixpence a week for helping the milkman. I got 11 and threepence a week in the jam factory for 48 hours. You know, all that is still less than one pound a week. But I was getting five shillings a night singing with the orchestra or the band, you know. And uh, So I was rich at the age of 14, and I decided to stay that way. So I always worked 16 hours a day right up until I was 65. Is that right? Wow. I used to work on the shop floor in the factory, because I can do every job on the shop floor, you see. I taught myself how to make the cabinets and how to do the covering. 
And with the youngsters that came along later on, when we grew a bit, I taught all them. Going from the band, I studied drums under Max Abrams, who was the top teacher. I taught Jack Parnell, Eric Delaney, and many of the other top drummers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was playing in this uh, Battle of Britain club, which was RAF camp, <clears throat> every Sunday night. And uh, it was very good, but one week the uh, MC said, and now our drummer leader is going to play Skin Deep next week. That was when Lee Belson brought out Skin Deep. Right. And I thought, my God, I've never played an extended solo in my life. I've done fours and eights and that sort of thing, sixteens, but never extended. <laughs> so uh, I said to him, what made you say that? You never discussed it with me first of all. He said, I thought it would be a good crowd puller next week. All right. So I went to Bronze in Oxford Street that used to supply all the music for bands, you know, orchestrations. And I bought the Skin Deep one, opened it up. Everything was there for all the other musicians. And for the drummer, it was ad lib. <laughs> so I went out and bought the Belson recording and took down basically what he was playing. And... Uh, on the Sunday, I managed to get my musicians to come in half hour early to go through Skin Deep three times. I had a hell of a job because musicians in those days were all sight readers. And they said, we can read it. I said, well, think of me. I have nothing to read. I've got to practice it a bit. So anyway, they came in and we went through Skin Deep three times. And I thought, oh, God, after the interval, this is going to be disaster because we never got it quite right, you see, during the practice. <clears throat> anyway, after the interval, we went on, and it went well. And then a couple of lads came up to me and said, will you teach us to play drums? And uh, that's how it happened all the way through. Every gig I played, <clears throat> I was doing skin deep, and every gig I was getting youngsters come to me asking me to teach them to play drums. So through the 50s, I did virtually nothing else but teach. I, I used to take down all the parts from the records and uh, of course there was no photocopiers or anything like that in those days. <clears throat> so I used to have to get up at four o'clock every morning writing out drum scores and drum parts for the pupils. And uh, then in 1959, I decided to open a drum shop to go with the drum studio. Wrong, because I taught all the top rock and roll drummers, because I was the only teacher that would teach rock and roll. Uh, <laughs> the, um, as I was saying, that, that was in late 59. So in listening to that, to me, one of the most compelling elements of his character, as well as the life story that he presents to us, is this incredible... Uh, dilemma that he had as a child being nearly um, completely covered in the body cast because of polio and not only uh, overcoming that obstacle but becoming a dancer I mean just incredible it's sort of like the opposite that you would expect from someone who had such a traumatic childhood and and uh, so many limitations physically well and beyond that too the fact that that you know obviously his physical limitations as a kid prevented him from really receiving any formal education so he has basically no schooling under his belt and then he goes on to design and engineer and create what I would consider I mean I'm not an engineer so it's super complicated <laughs> equipment that it just makes you wonder like how I went to school I went to college I went to a lot of college I don't know how to do that <laughs> like so I think that really shows uh Jim's perseverance and natural ability to overcome obstacles and I think his charm had something to do with it too yeah. I mean obviously just listening to this you can tell he was a really nice guy and people gravitated towards him and wanted to get the best out of themselves for him. And so as a result, he hired some pretty amazing engineers and um, assistants over over his career that helped propel his products. And I guess that's what we're going to talk about next is the creating of the first uh, rock and roll amplifier. Um, and for many of you, uh, you're very familiar with the idea of the Marshall stack uh, by itself is an image of all these stacks of amplifiers and this huge loud sound. But I thought we'd bring in the expert Mike and gr growing up in the industry and knowing what the differences are in amplifiers. Tell us a little bit about your impression of the Marshall amp. 
Well, in my opinion, what uh, the Marshall amp does that other amps hadn't done in the past, where it really gave rock and roll the dirty sound that it needed and wanted. And um, rock bands took this to a whole new level, never really seen before, with these crazy Marshall stacks being just the backline of their stage. And we're talking like 30 or 50 amps, just totally ridiculous. And it, 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 um, it pretty much started um, the revolution of trying to make your band as loud as possible and gave rock and roll the the complaint of many parents as being noise. So I think that um, it revolutionized the industry and made the genre what it is. And, you know, he had a nickname of the uh, the father of loud, and I think that's a pretty good title for him. So here's Jim talking about creating the first rock and roll amplifier. Along came Pete Townsend, <clears throat> Richie Blackmore, who was playing with one of my pupils in the school group, uh, Big Jim Sullivan, who is still one of the top session guitarists in England, and they explained the sound to me Well, I had a good ear, and I realised what it was that they wanted. It was the um, harmonics from the tube, or the valve as we call it, and uh, I said to Ken Brand, my repairman in the shop, let's have a go at making that amplifier, Ken. <clears throat> he said, well, I'm not really good enough for that. He said, but there's a kid at EMI. He's only 18, but he's brilliant. I said, well, bring him along to see me. So he brought this Dudley Craven along to see me. And uh, I said to him, how would you like to join a team to make the first real rock and roll amplifier? He said, I'd love to. So he started with me. He did... Uh, five prototypes which I turned them all down because they were not quite the sound I wanted <clears throat> and on number six up came the right sound and I said Dudley you've done it that's going to be the Marshall sound from now on and it has been ever since hmm. that's amazing. <laughs> anyway as far as show business is concerned I've been in show business now for 65 years I still perform on drums I still sing uh, mainly it's for charity these days because I belong to this, which is called the Water Rats. Anyway, the, <laughs> the Water Rats is the oldest charity in show business. It's 115 years old this year. Bob Hope is a member. Howard Keel. Laurel and Hardy used to be. So many top entertainers have been Water Rats, but there will never, ever be more than 200. You cannot ask to be a member, you have to be invited and you have to be one of the top entertainers. Yeah, right. Fortunately I was and I'm a water rat. But um, we have um, what we call companion rats. Prince Philip is one. Prince Edward. Mm. Numbers of other top people, you know, are companion rats. Mm. And uh, we do a good thing for charities, you know. Everybody thinks the Variety Club is show business. I don't know about in America, but it's not in England. It's all run by accountants and solicitors, etc. And uh, we, the Water Rats, go along to functions, their charity functions, to help raise the money. Because if they hadn't, did not have you know, no names at the function, they wouldn't draw the crowd. So a lot of us go along to all those functions and we raise money uh, for Sunshine Coaches, which the Variety Club do, uh, coaches, which the uh, Taverners do. Oh, you, you name it, we help every charity. <laughs> and so would they call you and, and ask you if you're available? For ask the ask if we're available, yes. Is that right? Mm, yeah. Sounds very rewarding. Yeah. So I still play drums and I still sing. <laughs> That's great. <clears throat> Tell me a little bit about the progression of the amp when and the product line. How did that uh, progress? Well, it started with the JTM 45, and uh, that was very successful. And uh, after that, uh, we still kept producing that, and we went up to the 1985. I did the models out of plywood, sent them to a company to have them produced, you know. But I see, you know, well, it's just, you know, it's common sense to have inserted handles. 
and uh, I designed those first of all. <laughs> and uh, from then on, you know, later on, Eric Clapton used to practice in my shop. And uh, he said one day, he said, I could do with a, a unit, you know, for touring. He said, but I want it all in one box. And that's how the um, Blues Breaker combo came along. He was the first one to have one. Oh, yes, well, we're doing limited editions of all the vintage models now. And, uh, you know, we cannot make enough of them, although we restrict it very much, because if you do too many, it's not a collector's item anymore. And that's what we aim for. It, it wouldn't be fair to people like Korg or anybody else or any of my other distributors if we made more. For instance, the Zac uh, 203, which we do for him, and you probably know it's on the front panel. I've allowed him to have his autograph on there as well. Uh, but it's restricted. Again, it's really captivating to hear Jim's story, and he's just got a way about him that, you know, even though if you've never met him, which, you know, Mike and I haven't, you think you, he's, he's like an old friend when you hear him talk. Like, and I think that that's a really good way to connect with people. And as Dan mentioned earlier, it probably led to a lot of his success in business and in life. Um, <clears throat> and a part in there that I really enjoyed hearing was him, Jim talking about a lot of the charity work he was doing at the time and the guys he traveled with. And he was back to playing drums and everything like that, which is not something most people associate with him. Um, but our next segment is going to be kind of wrapping up here, Jim Marshall, before we move on to our next interview. And we're going to be hearing about him talking about marketing his products and associating them with artists, famous artists, and his strategy, business plan moving forward with that, as well as, you know, kind of some advice, some keys to his success, as well as what we do here, kind of touching on that. And that's in the importance of preserving history, the history of the industry. As I say, the first ones were Pete Townsend, Richie Blackmore, and those sort of people. And uh, they all paid the full price. I don't believe in giving products away. I still get people come to me and say, can we promote your product? What will you do for us? And I say, well, nothing other than you go and buy the products. And I explain to them that <clears throat> If we were to give things away, the money's got to come from somewhere and it's got to go into the product, you know, by a percentage for what we give away. I said, is that fair? You can afford to pay for yours. The kid that walks in the store for the first time to buy his first amplifier, actually, he's got to pay for yours. And I said, I cannot see that being fair. And they all agreed with me after a while. But the funniest thing was, when um, Jimi Hendrix came over, first of all, he was playing at a jazz club called Ronnie Scott's in Soho. And the group there were using a complete backline of Marshall. So he said to Mitch Mitchell, uh, OK, I'll use it. And at the end of the evening, he said to Mitch, I've got to meet this character who's got my name, James Marshall. It is, you know. And uh, he said, but I want to buy that equipment. So this tall, lanky American came to me with Mitch into my shop, and he said, I'm going to be the greatest man. I thought, oh, God, another one going to ask for something for nothing. And within the next breath, he said to me, I want to pay the game rate. I don't want any discounts. He said, but what I, but what I do want is service wherever I am in the world. I thought, oh, God, I'm going to have an engineer traveling with him. But he had a fantastic roadie that spent, I think it was up to about three weeks in the factory, learning simple um, repairs. So we were never called out. And he bought four complete setups <coughs> so that he would have them in four different places in the world so that he would not have to transport them too far. And Jimmy was a fantastic guy. We got him very well. He had a marvelous sense of humor. <laughs> Well, same as another one of them, very friendly with Les Paul, you know, he's got a great sense of humor as well. <laughs> yeah, we interviewed Les and uh, found that to be very true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's a shame that Jimmy died at the age of 29 because I don't think he'd reached his real peak. If he was around now, I don't think anybody would touch him. There's another interesting aspect of the success, I think, of Marshall, and that, I think, is the fact that you have studied and learned the entire process, down the floor, all the way through. Oh, yes, I can do every job on the shop floor. As I say, I used to do that and do my book work of a night time. So, How important is that, do you think? To me, that's very important. You should know your product. You should know the limitations of people on the shop floor. And uh, years ago, when people came to me and said, I cannot do it in that time that you've allowed, I used to show them that I could do it a lot quicker. And I said, I don't want you to do it as quick as I can, but I want you to do it with the time that I've allowed. Because you've got to control things in a manufacturing area, otherwise your prices would go up and up and up. So everybody knows that I've done the job on the shop floor and they cannot pull the wool over my eyes. <laughs> it's a good way to do it. So at the 40th anniversary, tell me what other thoughts you have about the, the key of your success. Well, the key of my success is working with people not manufacturing something and say, well, that's what we're doing. You know, we talk to the lead guitarists in the world and uh, my guitarist, Jeff Whitehorn, who's been with me now, I think, 15 or 16 years. You know, he's the lead guitar with Procol Harum and many of the other things. As a matter of fact, he's just got uh, a job in the West End of London in a show and uh, I don't know what I'm going to do without him for a while. <laughs> but uh, he comes in regularly and tries out the new products the same as uh, Gary Moore you know, people like that they all come in and try it first say, I don't like that or I like that it's a great job or whatever you know. and uh, we work together and that's the only way to do it is to work with the customer You are a supporter of our museum. I would love to have your thoughts about um, preserving the history of the industry. How important is that? Well, I think that's very important. <clears throat> for instance, you know, that uh, prototype we put in the shop for the first time. A lad came in and he said, I must have one of those. I said, well, the first 23 are sold. He said, how about that one that was in the shop to start with? I said, well, you know, it was only the prototype. He said, it sounded very well, can I have that one? I said, all right, son, you know, and I gave him a price for it, put it in a cabinet. And about three months later, he came back in and said, uh, I like the design you've done of the new cabinet with the 45. He said, can I buy one of those? What will you give me for the one? I said, well, it was only the prototype, as you know. Anyway, I said, all right, son. I'll give you what you paid for it to go towards the new one. He said, thank you very much. And his father was very pleased with him, you know. <laughs> and uh, then I didn't know what to do with that amplifier. I put it in a cupboard in my shop in London until we moved to Bletchley, where we are now. And then I still had it and I thought, oh my God, I'll put it in this cupboard. And I put it in another cupboard, you see, not thinking you know, about my museum that was going to be. And then, uh, oh, about 10 years ago, I thought, <clears throat> you know, we'll show that off. <laughs> but it's very important, not only because of the money involved, but because it's history. You know, eventually it's history, isn't it? And, uh, you know, it's the history of our profession or our musicians. It's got to be noted for years to come because this has been a great period for history. That's terrific. Well, thank you very much for spending some time with us this morning. We really appreciate it. Anything You're welcome. To add, did I miss anything important? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Only that um, you did a fantastic job and you're obviously doing a wonderful job for a museum. 
So once again, that was Jim Marshall, and you can view that entire interview on our website, nam.org slash library. And next up, we are going to hear from Hartley PV. Dan, have any cool factoids about him? <laughs> well, of course, um, PV is another name, just like Marshall. That just sticks out in the industry as um, innovative and creative in their own products. And the fact that it came from a single person like Marshall uh, is very compelling and a great story. Uh, Hartley grew up in uh, Mississippi and started his company in Meridian. And that's where the factory still is today. And what's interesting to me is just the the idea of of Hartley, you know, like so many people starting out wanting to be a rock and roll star. He grew up not too far from where Elvis uh, started and the blues really developed B.B. King. And, you know, one of his all time heroes was Bo Diddley. And uh, he was right there in that scene in the late 50s and wanted to be a rock and roll star. And when that didn't work out, he looked at what was needed and said, hey, I, I need to make a better amplifier than the ones that I can afford. So uh, so went that career. So kind of an amazing development and, of course, a huge contribution to the music products industry. So we're going to hear Hartley talking uh, about his background growing up in his dad's shop, as well as meeting his hero, Bo Diddley, and getting into manufacturing. I had an incredible opportunity to learn the business from the inside out as opposed to the other way. And I had the opportunity to grow up in a very interesting place at a very interesting time. Uh, a lot of people don't know where rock and roll came from. It didn't come from New York or L.A. Uh, it came from the banks of the Mississippi River, from New Orleans to, up to maybe St. Louis. Um, I grew up in Mississippi. My dad uh, graduated from high school in 1932, and that was the middle of the Depression. And the only skill that he could uh, get paid for was playing saxophone. So for four years, he, uh, he uh, played in a swing band. It went, played all over the South. And in 1938, he came back to a little town called Meridian, Mississippi, about halfway up the state, very close to the Alabama line. And he opened a music store with $50 and a secondhand piano. And he met my mother, and I came along in 1941 almost 42 because my birthday is December the 30th, 1941. I was supposed to be a Christmas present, but I was a few days late. Um, anyway, I grew up in a music shop, and my dad, being a product of the Depression, he could squeeze a nickel until the buffalo would scream. And like fathers are prone to do, they give the sons all the jobs that nobody else wanted to do. So my two jobs, well, actually three jobs, was taking out the trash, uh, repairing record changers, and most people today have forgotten what a record changer is, but it had all kind of little gears and cams and stuff like that, and the idea you stack a bunch of records on it, and it would drop them one at a time, and the needle would play across them, and at the end it would pick up and come in and drop another one, and they were mechanical nightmares, and my dad sent me to school. He was a Magnavox dealer, so he sent me to school on his uh, record changers. And some of them were made in England by a company called Calero. And the American made ones were made by a company called VM, the voice of music. And my job was to fix all these things. And little old ladies would stack a big stack of records like that on there. And, and the arm would pick up and come across and they'd reach down and grab the arm and say, no, 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 that's not what I wanted to play. And, and when they did that, all the little stuff would, would, would disintegrate. Also, I, I got to buy the records because, as my dad, uh, he also sold records and, uh, and photographs. And, and he said, well, I, I knew what the kids wanted to hear. I never will forget the first time I heard uh, Ray Charles' What Did I Say? I, I played it until the needle went through the thing. Um, and I, I got pretty good at, you know, fixing things. And I've always been good with my hands and... Uh, I used to win model airplane contests, and I used to win science fairs, and all my teachers uh, thought that I should be a, a genius and make straight A's, but hell, you could look at my grades and see that I wasn't a genius. The truth is, I was good with my hands. I could build things, and I took every shop course, well, we call it from a vocational school, 
Uh, all through high school, I took four semesters of machine shop. I could make anything. I could make a guitar tremolo. I could make a, a zip gun. I could make a cannon. And I did. I made all kinds of stuff. I took uh, two semesters of what they, they then call radio. Today it would be called electronics. I took sheet metal. I could make a chassis. And frankly, had I not had that training, I couldn't have started my company. In 1957, I went to a concert in Laurel, Mississippi, and saw a guy named Bo Diddley. And Bo was one of the first really rock and roll guys, and, and I just went nuts. I went back and told my dad that I wanted to, to play guitar. And, and before that, my dad started me out on clarinet, and I didn't like clarinet, so I switched over to trumpet. And he told me that if I would get in the junior high school band, that he would buy me a car. And in all candor, I had little interest in sticking my trumpet under my arm and prancing up and down Main Street while all my uh, so-called buddies, you know, made obscene gestures and made all kind of comments. But uh, honestly, at that time, I would have probably drank a bucket of buzzard puke to get a, get a car. And of course, once I got the car, I lost all interest in playing in a marching band. Anyway, I went back and told my dad, I said, Dad, I want to play guitar. He said, oh, son, you don't want to play guitar. Guitar players are lousy. They don't pay their bills. It's rock and roll. It's horrible. It won't last. Blah, 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 all that stuff. Of course, I was at that time like 15, 16 years old, and I wanted to be a rock star. I could envision all the chicks chasing me down. And, but the truth is, I was a lousy musician. My dad was a great musician. I was a lousy musician. And uh, I was a mechanical guitar player. I was kind of like a robot. I would take a, I would take a 45 RPM record, you know, the ones with a big hole in it, uh, I'd slow it down to 33, and I would very meticulously learn the licks. And the truth is, I was a robot. And back then, and maybe still, but back then, if you played a song and it sounded like the record, people thought you were good. And two or three of my little show tunes it sounded exactly like the record. Of course, it took me nine months to learn it. And if somebody wanted to jam, I was, I was out of luck. Couldn't do it. But finally, I got good enough after about eight years to, in, when I was in college to get in some little bands. And I got in a little dormitory band. We used to play for $50 and all the beer we could drink. And, of course, every band needs gear. They needed a bass amp or a bass or a PA or whatever. We used to call it PA back then. Um, and I would build it. And the first little band I was in, we played a few little dormitory gigs. And it, we were okay, not anything. And we had, you know, I could play C, A minor, F, and G. Half the slow songs then were that progression. But anyway... Uh, I built, I would come home on the holidays and sometime on the weekends and I would build the gear. And after I built all the gear, they wanted, they kicked me out. And I said, well, you know, that, you know, stuff happens. So being the eternal optimist, a few, few months later, I got with some other guys and we sat around and we said, well, why don't we form a group? So we did. And, and uh, unbelievably, history repeated itself. I built all the stuff they needed and I went to practice one afternoon and I said, well, listen, so-and-so here is going to sit in with us, and he plugs in and goes, diddly, 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 diddly. that's it, gone again. So I was really disheartened by that, but I said, yeah, you know, well, okay. So being the eternal optimist, I got up with some more folks a few months later, and we formed a group, and I'll be damned if history didn't repeat itself again. By the time I built all the stuff, they kicked me out. And I went back to my room at uh, university, and I looked in the mirror, and I said, well, sport, it looks like you're not going to be a rock star. What are you going to do with the rest of your life? By this time, it's 1964. I'm, uh, a, um, I'm a junior in college, about to be a senior. So I said, well, you know, I'm not the best guitar player, but I'm pretty damn good at building things. And I love music, and I love musicians. I think I'm going to do what every musician I've ever met, at least up to that time, said. They all said, I wish somebody would make good gear at a fair price. Now, that was especially important 
by roughly the mid-60s because something had happened that changed the music business forever. When rock and roll first bloomed about 1954, 55, uh, everybody knows about Elvis and Chuck Berry and all that and all the guys from New Orleans, Little Richard and Fats Domino and music exploded in the latter half of the 50s. I mean, it was just everywhere. But by the by the early 60s, Motown really hadn't come on. And it was a time of what I call the pretty boy singers, Fabian and Beach Blanket Bingo and such toe tappers as It's My Party and I'll Cry If I Want To. Well, the Brits were very uh, influenced by this seminal American rock and roll, so they kind of repackaged it and sold it back to us. And that resulted in what most people refer to as the the British invasion, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and all these British groups. And music exploded again for the second time. And because I had all these shop courses, if you will, I knew how to build a chassis. I knew how to build a cabinet. So my first products uh, were kind of interesting. Uh, solid state had just come in, and I didn't know anything about solid state. So I was looking through the uh, classifieds of one of the electronic magazines, and I saw an ad for a company in Opelika, Alabama, which isn't too far from me, and they offered solid-state engineering services. So I contacted these people, and these people, uh, the name of the company was Ortronics, O-R-R Tronics, and the guy that owned the company was a fellow by the name of J. Herbert Orr, and Orr had been in the Signal Corps in World War II, and he was part of a unit that uh, basically went in a tape recorder factory, and uh, they gave him the formula for making the tape. So I have a great Hartley PV story. Oh, do tell us. Oh, okay. It better be great. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I was fortunate enough to meet him at a NAM show um, when I was a lot younger. I think I was like 11 or 12. And I was going to the NAM shows with my dad. Um, since he had a music store, we would go every year. And I remember being at the PV booth and my dad talking to Hartley. And um, he introduced me as his son. And Hartley took me under his arm and walked me away from everybody else and told me how he started out in a music store, just kind of, you know, sweeping up, taking out the trash, all that kind of thing. And if I wanted to do anything in the music industry, I had to stick with it at the store and really work my butt off. And it was just a really motivational talk that he gave me when I was young, and I wasn't expecting it at the time, but it's very cool to see that um, he's inspiring younger people in the music industry to, to keep going. And now you're at the pinnacle of all things music industry related. Yeah, and it's come full circle because we're talking about them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's awesome. So we're going to hear next uh, Hartley telling the story of the start of his company um, and how that the foundations kind of grew with just a couple amps that he was manufacturing, as well as him transitioning and making a solid body guitar. But a lot of people don't realize that it's more than just amps. It's He, he has the capability to make uh, instruments as well. He's very good with his hands. And then we'll hear him introducing the digital audio talking about introducing the digital audio interface as well. I started out with two amplifiers. I had one bass amp, one solid state amp. And I would go out and I'd build one a week and go sell it to a dealer. Come back, build another one, build another one. Could never get started. And over in Montgomery, Alabama, the dealer said, son, I'm not interested in your amplifiers. I got more amplifier brands than I know what to do with. But, if, you know, if you had a sound system, I'd be very interested in it. And then there were basically only two sound systems out there. So I said, well, I can do that. So I went home and designed a a four-channel, 100-watt PA system and two columns. And and column speakers back then, if it it wasn't a column, nobody wanted it. So I had four 10s and four 12s, two models. So I went out and I sold them like hotcakes. But I couldn't build them because before I would build one chassis and one cabinet. One chassis, one cabinet. But now... I had to build a cabinet for the electronics 
and two speakers. And the way we used to build speakers back then, we'd put little what they call furring strips around the front and around the back. We'd drill all the holes and stretch the grill cloth over the speaker board and mount the speakers from the back and about 30 screws in the front and 30 screws in the back. And, and I built about I built about a dozen or so of those. I said, damn, there's got to be a better way. So having had all these shop courses, I said, well, you know, I don't need all these screws. I can just groove the, the front board in, and I can glue it together, and I won't have any screws to put in there. It'll, uh, the, 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 the front and back will actually be the fixturing to hold the thing square, and I'll just glue them together with this Elmer's glue all that I was using. And I did. I made a cabinet with no screws. It was all glued together, and the front and back, that was the fixture for keeping the thing square. So then I said, okay, now I've got to figure out a way to cover it because the old way of covering it took five pieces of cloth. You had to have a, a top, a bottom, two sides, and a back. Five times you have to cut, five times you have to cover. So I said, well, that, that's ponderous as hell. I can figure a better way. So I figured out a way to cover it with one piece. So then I said, well, well you know, I can't put the speakers in from the back. I'll have to put the, I'll have to put the speakers in from the front. So I did that. So I had to put the grill cloth on a frame. Well, the problem is if you've got a, a, a column speaker, let's say the column is like this and like so, um, when I would stretch the grill cloth, it would, it would do this. I said, well, damn, what can I do? I tried putting a stick in the middle, and that hit on one of the speakers, and that was... So I said, well, what I need is some angle iron. So there was an aluminum window place in Meridian, Mississippi, where my little factory was. So I went out there and I said, what kind of stock extrusions do you have? And he said, well, we only have two. We've got a half inch by a half inch. I said, well, let me try that. So I put these half inch by half inch extrusions and it wasn't strong enough to do anything. So I came back and I said, that, that didn't work. It bent with the, with the, with the thing. He said, well, we got, we got these one half inch by two. And I said, well, let me try some of that. So I went and got some of that and I put it on the inside of the cabinet. And sure enough, that... That straightened it out. So one day, just totally by accident, I put the thing back in there backwards. And I said, you know, that looks pretty good. That's where the strips came from. So from then till now, the biggest part of our business has been sound reinforcement. Uh, by, by, the, by the early 70s, we were able to make amplifiers 100, 200 watts. And the speakers wouldn't hold up. I kept blowing out Alltech Lansing speakers. I kept blowing out JBL speakers. I would go to them and tell them, and they said, well, the problem with UPV is your customers don't understand how to use our precision transducers. And I said, well, guys, that may be true, but when a JBL blows out one of my cabinets, they don't blame you. They blame me. And they, 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 they were so condescending, it was unbelievable. So in utter disgust uh, in 1976, I started making my own speakers. And we still do, by the way, because people forget that the loudspeaker is the weakest link in the system. So that's why I make loudspeakers. And, you know, experience is the great teacher, they say. And if, if, if indeed that's true, I've been in the classroom longer than most of them. Uh, I started my business in, well, actually, my first patent was in, in 1964. Uh, I, 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 I've classed the start of my business as the day I graduated from college in June the 1st, 1965, which we are in our 50th year right now. And good Lord willing, I hope to make it till I'm 50, but I'm going to find out the best way to make a solid body guitar. And I've always been a gun collector, and I've always been fascinated with the fit and finish of a fine rifle, most of which are mass-produced. And I said, well, you know, whatever machine makes those rifle stocks so precise that you can't stick a business card between the wood and the metal. If I had a machine like that, I could make guitar necks. So I did a little, little research and I found out it was called a copy lathe. They don't make them in this country, they make them in Europe. So I bought a, a machine in Germany called a Geiger. I could make four necks in five minutes with one operator. So I bought that and since the, the guitar that we were trying to do, I worked with a guy out in uh, Texas from Houston. His name was Chip Todd. He came in and we came up with a whole new way to make guitars using uh, CNC 
routers, computer control routers. Actually, ours was a router profiler. We didn't just do X and Y. We also went to Z. We had a huge machine. It was an Ekstrom Carlson, but it had three big old motors on it like this, and it had six workstations, and it never stopped. While it was carving three bodies, they were offloading the other three, and then when when you, when the, when these finished, the, it would go down there and carve those. So the machine never stopped. And you know, today, you know how most people make guitars using CNC machines. One of one uh, guy that makes acoustic guitars, he brags about using CNC like it's something new. I did it in '76. We totally revolutionized the way guitars are made forever. And, and what they didn't understand is I, w- I wasn't making guitars with computers. I was making guitar parts with computers. And, you know, that machine, they can hold tolerances of, you know, less than a thousandth of an inch. The finest craftsman using hand tools and old-fashioned pin routers, if he can hold a 32nd of an inch, he's doing very, very well. But, see, that machine doesn't know if it's cutting wood or aluminum or plastic or whatever. But... I was turning out precision guitar parts at, a, at an amazing rate. So that's the history. When I told you about speakers, from a car radio to the largest concert sound system that you can imagine, if you turn up the gain full up, first thing that's going to fail is going to be the loudspeaker. That's why I make speakers. And I did it not because I wanted to. I did it because the people that made speakers wouldn't listen. PV has been a, a, a kind of a Cinderella story. Uh, we built it the old-fashioned way. I worked my butt off. I used to work day and night. I'd work at the office all day, and at night I'd go home and lay out circuit boards. Um, and I did that. In fact, is for seven years, um, I didn't take a vacation. Uh, I lived in a $50 a month apartment with one big old stove in the middle to heat and a room air conditioner. Um, but PB. PV has been a, a very interesting uh, thing for a little southern town. Over the years, uh, we've had uh, somewhere around 14,000 people to flow through PV. And in a little town of 35,000, there's hardly a family that hadn't had a son, daughter, mother, uh, father, cousin, nephew, niece that hasn't worked at PV somewhere. So we've made quite an impact uh, in that area. But most of all, we've, we've changed the industry. Every, all those people that said I was crazy, that's what they're doing now. And, uh, you know, I mentioned, you know, a while ago, experience is a great teacher. And another thing about experience that's very interesting, experience is cumulative. It's kind of like radiation, it's cumulative. When I started out, I didn't know much. Thought I did. When I graduated, I, when I graduated from college, I actually thought I knew something. I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything. In fact, as I tell young people today, I said, well, you know, I appreciate you got a degree, but the truth is uh, a college degree today is hardly much more than a learner's permit. And they get all wadded up about it, but that's the truth. Most of what I know, I didn't learn in school. I learned from getting out there and doing it. We learned how to do things that people said couldn't be done. In 1993, we introduced the world's first digital audio networking system. And today, you'd be hard-pressed to go to a theme park anywhere in the world that isn't running our media matrix system. Uh, We do airports, we do casinos, we do theme parks, we do transportation things. We did the the huge new airport in Beijing for the Olympics uh, uh, several years ago. We we, we installed that. We installed the sound system in the Atlanta airport. We installed the sound system in SeaTac or Seattle, Tacoma, Phoenix Sky Harbor. Uh, We just finished Birmingham, Alabama, and I could go on and on. And people don't have any idea that PV does that. And, you know, people ask me sometimes, well, why, why do you do that? And the simple answer is because we can. And that technology, we've learned to do all these things. We make our own circuit boards. We make our own chassis. We make our own speakers. We make our own cabinets. A lot of these people in the speaker business, they don't make speakers. They build cabinets. They're, they're box stuffers. I make the whole damn thing. And by doing that, by being vertically integrated, vertical meaning up and integrated mean together, we put it together from the ground up, and I can do it better. See, my goal was 
and still is, to be the best. And by definition, you cannot be the best unless you're different, and we are. At our company, we have about 500 telephones. Our telephone directory is first name only. If you don't know somebody's first name, you can't find them in a telephone directory. People don't know that. I won't let anybody in the company call me Mr. Peavy. I keep telling them that I'm not that old yet, although I'm, I'm sure knocking on the door, uh, being born in 1941. Uh, but the important thing is, I'm still here. And I believe business is kind of like a rodeo. You know, the one that wins is the one that can stay on the pony the longest. And as I look around, not many people have been on the pony for 50 years. Uh, hopefully, good Lord willing, I'm going to get to retire before too much longer. And I never will quit, quit. Uh, I love the creative part of what I get to do. Music is one of the few things that people will fight you over. It's about passion. Uh, you know, people fight you about politics, they'll fight you about religion, they'll fight about romance. But if you happen to be a country music fan and you're in a bar and somebody says, ah, oh, those people like country music and nothing but a bunch of hicks, you want to go, you know, or rock and roll or jazz, doesn't matter. Music is about passion. Thank God that it is because that's what keeps this thing going. And I got in this business so incredibly naive. I had no idea what I was getting into. No idea. Because to me, I kept hearing in my mind, I wish somebody would build good gear at a fair price. Not cheap, fair price. And that's what I've always done. But I didn't go out and copy, you know, X, Y, or Z. I did it a different way. And I'm not saying that I haven't borrowed ideas. I certainly have. But I don't go copy people. I, I want to do it. I want to build a better mousetrap. Hell, I was the first one that ever used automatic soldering machines to make guitar amplifiers. And I mean, they've been doing it in other industries for, for years. So I wanted to do, do things the best way because to me, happiness is never having to say I'm sorry. And, and I've been fortunate enough to, to change the industry. Okay, that was an awesome little segment there talking about various products and um, engineering different products that uh, Hartley had visions of. And I, what I love about this is, again, going back to the importance of the NAM Oral History Program, is that we might know the name PV, but until you take the time to really listen to his own words and his own stories, can you really get a sense as to what his missions and his visions have been since the very beginning of his career? And those are the hidden gems that are within this collection. And so this podcast, to me, is really important to be able to shed light on that. And um, I remember the first time I met Hartley was uh, in 2001 at an AM show. And you know, I, I kind of thought of him as, uh, you know, uh, wow, this big icon, big name in the industry. And I was so um, pleased to see that he was wearing a ribbon on his NAM badge that said, I support the Museum of Making Music. And I thought, well, that's really cool. That got a lot of people uh to acknowledge and, and learn more about our small little museum here in Carlsbad, California at the NAM headquarters building that he didn't obviously have to do. And just in wearing that, I thought that was a, a pretty neat thing. And the more I learned about him, the more I realized, as Mike had mentioned earlier, he was really into mentoring people and helping people. That's really a focus of what he's always done. Uh, just ask anybody that's worked for him in, uh, at PV. So these sort of uh, little elements of the personalities that come out in the interviews, I think, is really a, a compelling part of the, the collection. So let's, uh, let's learn some more. What's up next, Elizabeth? We're going to hear, that was a really good transition, because we're going to hear about Hartley talking about making a difference within the company and the market, as well as what he specifically does at, at PV and his role, uh, which is great, and then the growth of the pro audio market as well. You know, as human beings, the very best we can hope to do is to make a difference. And on a good day, I like to think that I have. And um, if I keeled over today, uh, there's a lot of people that are better off for my having been here. I've given opportunities to people that, you know, I used to hire people with long hair back in the 60s, and that was kind of a no-no with the establishment. I hired black folks. I trained people. And sometimes I hired people that weren't college graduates. Some of the smartest people I've ever met didn't have a college degree. And uh, I like to think that I've made a difference. 
In fact, sometimes people ask me, they say, well, Peavy, what, what, what is it that you do at Peavy? And what I do at Peavy, I am uh, a catalyst. And if you remember from high school chemistry, a catalyst is that which enhances or speeds up a reaction without itself being changed. And I haven't changed. I'm the same old guy that I used to be. I don't want anybody to kiss my fanny. Uh, happiness is never having to say I'm sorry. And I believe in my heart of hearts that I have made a difference. So well, that's, that's, the, that's the story of me. That's fantastic. You know, one of the things I would love to get your thoughts about is you guys were so important in the growth of the pro audio market, as we call it now. What were your thoughts about how that grew? Well, we just reacted to uh, what the market wanted. You know, there was a time in most of our lives when we didn't know what good sound was. When I had my 1957 Chevrolet in 1957, I was tickled to death with an AM radio. But, you know, people's expectations change. And we change with it. They want to hear clean sound. They want to hear uh, no, no distortion. We did all kind of crazy things. We, we came out with the first diamond-coated diaphragms for microphones where the diaphragm would act like a piston instead of undulating, thus causing distortion. And that's just one of our many, many, many patents. And we do things because it's the way it should be done. Like we do business in 136 countries. And if you blow a loudspeaker, I don't know if you ever had the misfortune to have to try to recone a speaker, but it is a mess. You've got to scrape all that stuff out of there. My premium speakers, when, when they blow out, and they can blow out, uh, you take away three bolts, take off the whole basket, cone assembly, put another one on, tighten the bolts, you're back in business. I try. Again, happiness is never having to say, I'm sorry. And yes, yeah, sometimes we make mistakes. I remember years ago, we bought several barrels of adhesive because, you know, speakers are put together. But the, the mix, the recipe, if you will, that they use wasn't good, and the damn speakers fell apart. Wasn't my fault. It was the... But that stuff happens. But over the years, we, we found out, you know, the people we can depend on. Because everybody that comes in to sell me components, uh, transistors or ICs or, or capacitors or whatever, they all co- no, none of them ever come in and say, well, you know, our stuff is crap, but you should buy some. They all come in and say, oh, ours is the greatest. And the only way you can find out is to buy some and try it. But over the years, you figure out who you can depend on and who you can't. That's another factor of, of experience. And as I look out there, um, uh, since Jim Marshall died uh, a couple of three years ago, Jim started his company, although it was a drum shop in 1962. Uh, I started mine in 1965, and he, he got in the business of, of, a few years later building amplifiers. Um, but he was the only one been around in my end longer than me. But now, amazingly, I'm the old man. Um, and good Lord willing, I've got a few more good years. <laughs> and we have one more clip left from Hartley PV's 2014 interview with Dan. And here he is talking about PV being a leading company and its longevity. I always tell people the truth, even when it pisses them off. But I'd rather have somebody PO at me for telling them the truth than for lying to them. And uh, look, I am not a fellow that... I was raised not to brag. I just don't. But I'm proud of what we do. I'm proud of the difference we've made. And there's a lot of people playing music uh, that frankly wouldn't have had the opportunity to play music if it weren't for me. But I recognized back in college that fateful day I looked in the mirror and said, well, son, you're not going to be a a rock star. I realized what my talent was. My talent was building things and designing things, not playing music. I'm not a finance guy. I hate spreadsheets. Don't show me a spreadsheet. Show me a graph. Show me a spreadsheet. I have to make a value judgment about every line. I don't want to do that. Show me a graph. Is it going up, going down? So I go hire people that are talented in those other areas, and I do my thing, and I let them do their thing. That's worked for me a few times. That probably didn't work because I put faith in people that, in retrospect, I shouldn't have. But the fact is... uh, when I recognized that I wasn't ever going to be a good player, it was, it was devastating. But 
you know, human beings always like to feel sorry for themselves, and I'm not going to tell you that I didn't feel sorry for myself about being such a sorry musician, because actually, I, for, for more than a few months, I, I felt like, you know, that I was just not dealt a winning hand. But I was too stupid to see are too naive to see what my talents were. And I do believe that every human being comes into this world with a little bag of tricks. You can call it talents. You can call it proclivities. You can call it ability. It doesn't matter what you call it, but every one of us are better at a few things than the average person, if indeed there is any such thing. My dad was a great musician. I'm not. But hanging a picture on the wall was a test of his mechanical ability. But... I, I'm total. I'm, I'm totally different. But you see, I, I've come to know that the trick in life is figuring out what your gifts are, and then using them. There's so many people that are miserable in their lives, miserable in their careers, because they believe their parents when their parents told them, you know, you can be anything you want to be. Well, technically, I guess that's correct. But the reality is, if you try to be something that you have no talent for being, you're never going to be successful. You're never going to feel good about yourself. And it's a mistake for people to say you can be anything that you want to be. But if you're going to be successful, you've got to have some talent. You come into this world, you've got your talent. There's nothing you can do about it. If you're not a good artist, you're not going to be able to draw. If you're not a good musician, you're not going to be able to play. There is one ability, though, that you can develop. And this has is, this is caused more very smart people to fail than anything I can think of. Ability, you're born with it. You can hone it up a little bit, but you're basically born with it. But most people, when the going gets tough, they quit. They just quit. Surrender. Ah, it's not worth it. Quitters never win and winners never quit. That's that old cliche. But the fact is, the ability that you can influence and you can enhance is stickability. And I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how well educated you are. I don't care how well financed you are. I don't care what your talents are. If you don't have stickability, you're never going to be as successful as you should be and could be. And I may not be smart in a lot of those other ways, but stickability, baby, I've got it. And, you know, the music and sound business is just like any other business. There's always one or two hot shots. But the test is how long can they stay on the pony? Because they come, they go. I've had the opportunity to watch people, and I've tried not to make the same mistakes that they made. Although, don't, don't get me wrong, I've made plenty of mistakes. But mistakes are learning opportunities, you know. And you're going to make mistakes. You, I mean, nobody is going to do anything of any consequence unless they copy something without making mistakes. And I've made thousands of mistakes and continued to. But thank God they have not, at least not until now, been fatal mistakes. But I do believe every human being has a set of talents. We don't come into this world with the instructions tattooed on our ass. You've got to figure out what you're good at and then do it. And then once you do it, don't quit. And I've, I've discovered that if you don't quit, it's probably about a 95% probability that your competitors, whoever they are at any one time, they will quit. They'll sell out. They'll change. They'll... You know, so I've seen thousands of companies come, thousands of companies go. And I've, you know, asked myself and the good Lord, why me? Why, why have you chosen me to do this? And <clears throat> the answer is, I don't know. I don't know. The, you know, you, you, you don't question gifts. You just go with it. You don't, the old saying, you don't look a gift horse in the mouth. So for reasons that I don't know, there's a lot of people smarter than me, more talented than me, better educated than me, much better financed than me. But after 50 years, I'm still, I'm still here. Okay, so that'll wrap up our industry heroes, this particular one on the guitar amp innovators of Jim Marshall and Hartley Peavy. A special thanks to Elizabeth for putting all this together, going through these interviews and pulling out some of the highlights, which I think uh, made a very compelling podcast. And a special thanks to Mike for doing all the post-production to make us sound like we know what we're doing all the time. And a special thanks to Zach Phillips for writing our intro and outro theme song. And I guess we should say thanks to Dan for sitting down and doing these interviews in the first place and giving us a job so we can be here with you. (laughs) (laughs) Hooray! (laughs) 
make sure you go online and leave us a review, rate us. And again, as always, if you have any suggestions for episodes or people you think that need to be in our collection, drop us a line at library at nam.org. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>